Okay, so now that we've looked at the English and the American Revolution, we're going to look finally at the French Revolution, which is probably, I mean, even though many of you perhaps might be more familiar with the American Revolution, the French Revolution is sort of the revolution um, that you study um, in history when you first learn about revolutions. It is, it, it profoundly alters uh, French society, in many ways profoundly alters Europe and world history uh, in a lot of ways. Um, it leads to the overthrow and execution and beheading of the monarch. Um, it, leads, it goes through a very radical phase, a reign of terror in which 40,000 counter-revolutionaries are guillotined um, in Paris. It leads to um, the concept of total war. It leads to the idea of citizen armies, where France raises mass amounts of armies out of the population, no longer these sort of professional royal armies. And they go to war with virtually every country in Europe to try to spread these revolutionary ideals. And it all sort of ends in the late 1790s when Napoleon Bonaparte, a general in the French Revolutionary Wars, overthrows the government and becomes head of the French government. And then in 1804, declares himself emperor um, and in many ways becomes far more powerful than any of the um, Bourbon uh, monarchs had been, even Louis XIV. And it leads to the Napoleonic Wars, and he's, of course, eventually defeated in 1815. And the monarchy is restored in France. Then there's another revolution um, in the 1830s. Um, and then you get a more sort of revolution. Then again, the monarchy is restored. And then you get um, one of Napoleon's uh, descendants, Napoleon III, who becomes emperor, but basically rules like a Bourbon king. And then in 1870, when France is defeated by Prussia in the Franco-Prussian War, France becomes a republic again and has been a republic ever since. But what we're going to focus on today is mostly on the French Revolution, or at least the lead up to the French Revolution of the 1790s, um, Napoleon's overthrow, and then of course the revolution in Haiti as well. But before we do that, um, I'm going to give you some background um, on not just the lead up to the French Revolution, but the, the structure of French society, which was very different um, than in English society. You don't get the emergence of commercial agriculture in uh, the French countryside like you do um, in England. Um, although before we do that, I should mention, I forgot in the last um, uh, the last video on the American Revolution, to just give you an example of historiography um, here. Um, if you're interested in um, historiography on the American Revolution, Gordon S. Woods, The Radicalism of the American Revolution, published in 1993, is a classic study of the American Revolution, which looks at its, its much more radical underpinnings and potential um, in a lot of ways. But for now, we'll go back to the French Revolution. Okay, so we're going to cover things like uh, the balance of class forces. You get the monarchy that is allied with landed elites. Um, Barrington Moore refers to them as an appendage of the monarchy. Um, we'll look at a fiscal crisis, the third estate, which is what becomes the bourgeois revolution, which I'll explain what the third estate is um, in the course of this video. And of course, the role of that urban um, sort of lower sort. Um, every revolution had them. And in the case of France, they're called the sans culottes. Um, we'll also... Um, break up this video uh, by showing you a short video uh, from Professor William Nelson, who actually is a historian of France, um, explaining specifically how the revolution led to the um, acceleration of capitalist um, development. All right, so before we get there, as I said earlier, the French Revolution in many ways uh, is precipitated by the American Revolution. It emerges out of a fiscal crisis that leads the French to the revolution. As I said earlier, the American Revolution, um, even though it's not talked about a lot in the United States, probably wouldn't have succeeded without the Americans' al alliance with the French. In fact, the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, which is kind of the key battle um, that wins the revolution or the War of Independence for the uh, American patriots, would not have succeeded without the intervention of the French Navy that trapped the British at Yorktown. So not only were the, the French directly involved in the fighting, but had spent tons and tons of money helping finance the American Revolution and send weapons, mostly just to get back at Britain for you know, losing the Seven Years' War. But before we get back to that sort of fiscal crisis that emerges out of the 1780s, we'll do a bit of background. Um, as I said, the situation in France is very different than the situation in England. And what I want to focus on here very quickly is that there are different ways out of feudalism, right? When we talked about the crisis of late feudalism, we focused mostly on England, but this is happening all over Europe. And the reason we focused on England was because it is only in England where that crisis of feudalism leads to the emergence of commercial agriculture, which leads to, you 
gotten, probably gotten tired of me saying this by now, right? Um, the peasantry coming off the land and this dual market of commodities and labor and yeah, 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 you understand it all by this point. But in France, they don't go in that direction at all. In France, you don't get that. France's way out of feudalism is absolutism. And again, for those of you that have taken any class in the history of Western civilization or European history will maybe be familiar with the term. Absolutism was the state that existed in France um, really from the end of feudalism until the French Revolution of 1789. Um, and it's at its, it, it sort of reaches its zenith under King Louis XIV, referred to as the Sun King. And Louis XIV ruled, um, was in power for about 70 years. He ruled from 16, at least his personal rule, from 1648 to 1715. That's sort of the era of the, the great sort of French king. He was referred to as the Sun King at that point. Now, what absolutism was, most people think of it as this kind of absolute power in the hands of the king. And that is true to a certain extent, but there's a sort of specific social structure to it. Essentially, it took the structure of feudalism and it nationalized it. Landlords still existed, but they were far more subordinated to the crown or the central government, much more than, say, the landlords in England. Right? Part of why this happened was that the Bourbon kings did not want to share political power with the nobility. But in order to do that, the Bourbon kings basically said, if you give up political power, we will not tax you. You can still earn money, right, from extracting rents and crops from the peasants, but the means for extracting that surplus crop or cash came from coercion from the central government, not the landlord. So even though the nobility had an income independent of the crown, their ability to extract income from the peasants came from the crown or was at least legitimized by the crown. So this is what I mean when feudalism was basically nationalized. Feudalism, um, it, in, when feudalism existed in the Middle Ages and even in England, right, it was very decentralized. Remember we talked about how it was this decentralized, politically fragmented area where each landlord was kind of king in his own right and the king depended on the allegiance of these landlords and if the landlords turned to these sort of noble landlords, the titled aristocratic nobility, if they turned against the king, they could overthrow him. And you see that. Uh, in England, right? Now in France, instead of the emergence of commercial agriculture, the way France gets out of feudalism is the creation of this absolutist state, where you take a lot of the procedures and structures of feudalism, but instead of it being localized, it all gets centralized in the crown, in the central government. And as I said earlier, these, these noblemen basically are kicked out of political power, right? They have no political power in the central government. Um, and because of that, Louis doesn't tax them, right? These sort of Bourbon kings don't tax them. But again, they earn money from their peasant, from the peasants on their land, but the only way they can do that is through the coercive power of the state. So their income is independent of the state. They're not taxed and they don't owe the state taxes, but their ability to earn income is dependent on the state. So what does this mean? Well, because the only way to extract more value from the peasants was to lean on them, right? push and coerce them, sometimes violently, it did not encourage these peasants to become uh, more efficient producers. It did not encourage them to rely on less labor, like in the case of the English countryside. This meant that both the central government and the lords had an incentive to keep the peasants on the land. And because they relied on what we refer to as extra economic or violent means to squeeze more surplus value out of the peasants, they never got more efficient. There was no enclosure movement in France. In fact, um, one of the one of the things that happens is you don't have primogeniture laws in England. You have this thing called primogeniture laws, which means if um, you are a landlord, all your land goes to the firstborn male heir, right, to maintain the size of these large landed estates. Whereas in France, it just gets divided up amongst um, all your children, usually male, but not necessarily. So you can see how this happens. If you have fifty thousand acres and four children, it gets divided by four, and then they have four children. And then their fourth of that 50,000 gets divided by four, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you don't have these large, consolidated, enclosed lands. And because the peasants stay on um, sort of the countryside and are able to still have access to the means of subsistence, you don't get wage labor. You don't get this emerging um, sort of um, you know, dual market for commodity. Um, and labor that you get in England, right? You get instead feudalism centralized in the national government. You could in a way call it national feudalism at this point. So how did the crown earn money then? 
Well, the crown could tax um, its subjects, but they couldn't tax the nobility. So it taxed everybody else. It taxed the poor, it taxed the middle class, it taxed merchants, sometimes it even taxed the peasants. And they also did something called the selling of offices. The French created a fairly large royal bureaucracy centered in Paris. But you could buy these offices. And at one point, these offices even became passed down. So for example, if I bought an office in the central government, I could pass that office down to my son. And they essentially functioned like a kind of hereditary system. They almost became nobles in and of themselves, that these offices became tantamount to property. Right? So a lot of what we'll see in the French Revolution is maintaining that access to these offices as a form of property. And the other key difference with France was that the Catholic Church was incredibly power, powerful, far more powerful than it ever was in England, although by this point England is of course um, uh, Protestant. Right? The Catholic Church owned a lot of land. In fact, some of the peasants even were, had their um, surplus crop extracted by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church always had a role in government. Um, and in fact, some of the closest advisors to the king were often cardinals um, appointed by the Catholic Church. And on top of all this, the crown had virtually unlimited power to arrest anybody that it wanted to. Um, I think they were called letters of cachet, where you could basically arrest anybody that was deemed subversive. You had no religious toleration. In France, this was legally, you had to be Catholic to have any rights and privileges at this point. Um, so centralized was the state, there was this famous saying that Louis XIV said was, uh, l'été c'est moi, and that I am the state, or the state is myself, right? This is what absolutism was. So this just gives you a picture of France's way out of this crisis of feudalism was to create an absolutist state, which didn't necessarily respect the role of private property in the same way that the English did. It created a nobility that had no role in government, that were dependent on its income through the crown's ability to force um, greater extraction of the peasantry and that kind of thing. So let's go back to the 1780s. So we have a very different structure of society um, in France. There's less diffusion of power. All the power is in the crown. So by the 1780s, France is bankrupt. And Louis the 16th, uh, or sorry, um, Louis the Louis the 14th, right, his deal with the nobility was he would not tax them. But by 1789, his descendant, Louis the 16th, needs money. And these, the selling of offices and imperial expansion is not providing it. So he has to raise taxes. But in order to raise taxes, he has to get the consent of the nobility, right? That was the deal. So he calls the Estates General, which hadn't been called in, I think it was over 100 years at this point. The Estates General is made up of three estates. You have the first, second, and third estate. The first estate is the clergy, right? The Catholic clergy, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Um, again, see how powerful they are. Second was the nobility. That was the second estate. So all the titled, you know, you know, um, marquis and dukes and earls and that kind of thing. The second estate. And the third estate was basically everybody else, which was represented about ninety percent of the French population. Though it was dominated by lawyers and urban merchants, some commercially minded landowners that were not no nobles but had a more um, sort of commercial mindset when it came to the ownership um, of land. Now, like when Charles first called Parliament in the English case, just so he could raise money, all the people that get called to the Estates General have different ideas and saying, well, wait a minute, now that you're calling the Estates General, we have some ideas about how government should possibly change. This, the third estate essentially wanted an end to feudal privileges. And the third estate at this point, this is in 1789, basically takes control of the revolution and declares itself the National Assembly of France. It's not technically a parliament, but it's moving in that way. Um, of a parliament. And they want to abolish the very concept of feudal privileges and the very idea of feudalism. Even though this is absolutism, it's not feudalism. It, it's absolutism, but in the clothes of feudalism, right? You have all these feudal rights, feudal estates, legal nobility. They even regulated who could wear what clothes, right? Only noblemen could wear certain types of clothes. And if you weren't a nobleman, you couldn't wear those types of clothes. So what we're seeing here is what we will see in the French Revolution is an end to royal absolutism, the emergence of a liberal constitutional regime, the Declaration of the Rights of Man of Citizen, and the abolition of corporatist privilege, guild restrictions, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. So, unlike in England, as I said, the landed elite sided with the monarchy. The thrust of the revolution as a result was led far more by the 
bourgeoisie, these urban merchants, um, rather than these kind of landed gentry like in the case of England. And a lot of what they wanted was an end to arbitrary rule. They wanted a breakup of the guild system, which I'll explain in, in, in a little bit a minute, and they wanted the rule of law and a liberal constitution. And of course you get what it, I referred to earlier as the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was actually um, co-written by Thomas Jefferson, who was an ambassador to France um, at the time. And it was very similar to the U.S. Declaration of Independence, right? The idea that government should rule in the name of the people and basic civil rights. In fact, if you listen to one of the quotes, quotes to the Declaration of Independence is, um, you know, uh, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if we look at the Declaration of the Rights of Man, men are born free and remain free and equal in rights and that all men had the right to liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. It goes a bit further um, than the Declaration of Independence, but you can definitely see the influence um, of the Declaration of Independence. And this was much more of, a, as I said, a bourgeois revolution than in England. It was led by these sort of urban merchants and these sort of middle class who also wanted access to the, to the bureaucracy and people who wanted the, to get rid of these guild restrictions. And this is important to note that the French Revolution wasn't so much people saying, we want to create the conditions for the development and acceleration of capitalism. A key thing was, the, again, the end of royal absolutism, the end of feudalism, the abolition of corporatist privilege, these guild restrictions. What these guilds were, and in a minute I'm going to let Professor Nelson explain this um, a bit better than I can. Um, he actually is a French historian. And what they were is they regulated everything, right? Restaurants didn't exist, really before the French Revolution. There were strict regulations of who could serve what, who was allowed to make what, what could, you know, who could serve soup, what kind of, could you have a soup kitchen? You couldn't just open a restaurant and serve what you wanted. Everything was heavily regulated under these guilds that determined everything. And it wasn't just um, your, your sort of professional life, it was your entire social being resolved around these guilds that governed everything from the production of shoes to the, you know, um, cooking to what will eventually become restaurants. But this idea of a restaurant didn't exist because of the guild restrictions. But I'm going to end there and let Professor Nelson explain this in a bit more detail. Um, and then after that, I'm going to talk about where the revolution goes, its more radical phase, and then eventually Haiti. I'd like to introduce my colleague, William Nelson, 